Now my grandfather and I have always been close. From starting out taking naps on his chest as an infant, to spending every day at his house as a preschooler and toddler learning my shapes and colors. As I've grown up, we've tried to stay close, which can sometimes be difficult when you live over 700 miles apart from each other. So my grandparents and I, we Skype. A lot. A lot. <laughs> which has allowed me to keep up with the important things, such as what flavor of ice cream they each got from Dairy Queen that day, or how tech support won't help them with their computers. Keeping in touch so frequently has allowed me to pick up on some of the more subtler things as well. For example, when I noticed some changes to my granddad's personality and memory, as well as some apathy to things he used to love. With these changes, my granddad began to also have problems with his stability, and began to fall more. Now, most people might chalk this up to normal aging, but as a medical student and a neuroscience PhD, I was afraid that something more serious was actually happening. I was afraid that all of these memory and personality changes were actually signs of a greater neurological-based problem. I'm sure we can all sympathize with not being able to remember where we put our keys one day, but there's a difference between that and being able to remember what you had for breakfast. I encouraged my granddad to see a physician, and some neuroimaging revealed that my granddad was experiencing tiny restrictions in blood flow to certain areas of his brain, or small strokes, which were resulting in something called vascular dementia. Now, to really understand what was happening in my granddad's brain, I want you all to imagine a network of sprinklers watering a lawn on a hot summer day. You could see how if any of the sprinklers became clogged or blocked, the grass in that area wouldn't be able to get the water or the nutrients it needs. Eventually, over time, this would cause the grass in that area to wither and die. Now that was exactly what was happening in my granddad's brain. As certain blood vessels became clogged or blocked, the brain cells in that area weren't able to get the oxygen or glucose they needed. Eventually, over time, that caused those cells in that area to die. And this cell death resulted in changes to his personality, his memory, and even his ability to walk. Now, I've memorized the signs and symptoms of stroke, learned how to measure strokes on neuroimaging, and even worked to develop a therapeutic to help the recovery of stroke sufferers. Despite all of this knowledge, I realized how powerless I was to help. All of these hundreds of hours of research and training didn't matter when I needed it the most, because there was nothing I could hand him and say, here, take this, this will make it better. Instead, everything I and others had been working on in the lab, while promising, was still years away from clinical trial, cl clinical implementation, and making it into the hands of the patients who needed it. Now, my granddad is one of 15 million people who experience a stroke worldwide and don't have time to wait for a therapeutic either. What's even more troubling is stroke is not only a leading cause of death and long-term disability worldwide, but it hits us especially hard here in Georgia. If you take a look at the map behind me, no, that's not a map of Waffle House locations. <laughs> That's actually a map of stroke incidents. See, we're all living in a region called the Stroke Belt, where the incidence of stroke is 30 to 50% greater than the rest of the country. This means that 20,000 people in Georgia will have a stroke this year, and one in 18 people in Georgia will have a stroke in their lifetime. As you can see, stroke is not only a globally devastating disease, but it's affecting our friends, our families, and our neighbors. We have to work together on strategies to help those suffering today. Now, the biggest bottleneck to helping those suffering today is the divide between therapeutic development and getting it to the patients who need it. This divide is referred to as the gap between the bench and the bedside. This means that while we're making great strides developing new therapeutics and techniques in the lab, they're not making it to the patients who need it. Now, why does this gap exist? 
while the drug development process is long, difficult, and expensive. First, a drug must complete studies in animal models. Then it must move through three phases of clinical trials. Phase one is safety testing. If no adverse side effects are seen after a couple months of testing in human patients, then a drug can move to phase two, or efficacy testing, where we ask, does the drug work? This phase can last a couple months to years and involves hundreds of patients. Only about 30% of drugs make it past phase two. In phase three, there's large-scale testing in hundreds of thousands of patients over multiple years. If a drug is one of the 14% that successfully completes all three phases of these clinical trials, only then can it be requested for FDA approval. This arduous process takes an average of 12 years and $1 billion to complete. Now, these FDA approval and clinical trial steps are absolutely necessary, and I'm not advocating we do anything to change them. I am, however, advocating we make this a two-fold process. In order to help patients to the best of our abilities, present and future, we must, one, continue therapeutic development, but two, simultaneously work on immediately implementable techniques. Frankly, because people are suffering and dying of this disease today, and it's our obligation to help them to the best of our ability. During my PhD, I wanted to test out this two-fold approach in practice. In order to focus on something with immediate potential, I set my eye on stroke recovery prediction models. While the ability to predict someone's recovery after stroke has improved in recent years, there's still room for refinement. I wanted to see if we could use neuroimaging a patient was already undergoing, such as MRI, and use that to predict their outcome down the line. Now, the goal of this work isn't to develop something that's going to immediately enhance a person's ability to walk or talk after a stroke. The goal of this research is, however, to develop something that physicians can use to make targeted and personalized rehabilitation plans for patients. In order to make these targeted plans, I took an MRI and made a bunch of measurements that were related to the brain after stroke. I then looked for the relationships between these measurements and long-term outcomes in our models. From this analysis, I was able to identify one measurement out of many tested that was significantly correlated to gait, behavior, survival, and recovery up to 12 weeks later. This is pretty awesome. We have something we can easily measure within the first 24 hours of stroke that can tell us what to expect out of a person's walking and recovery up to three months later. And this is something that doctors can start implementing for people like my grandfather right now. While doing this work, I also wanted to focus on the overarching goal of this twofold process, or developing a therapeutic that can aid in the recovery of stroke patients. Currently, there is only one FDA-approved small molecule therapeutic for stroke called TPA. Now, TPA works to break up the clot. Think Drano for the brain. Drano. But it has no direct mechanisms to preserve, protect, or regenerate tissue. Thinking back to our hose analogy, it's like finally being able to untangle or unclog that hose after hours of decreased water flow. Sure, it'll help save some parts of the dead and dying grass or brain, but for the areas that's already died, it's already too late. Building off the work of others before me, I worked with my lab mates to develop a therapeutic with the potential to heal this neurological damage. This therapeutic called neural stem cell-derived extracellular vesicles, or NSEVs, are nano-sized packets of DNA, RNA, and protein. Instead of just working to reopen the hose, like current approved therapeutics, with these NSEVs, we're actually reseeding parts of the dead and dying lawn to salvage what used to be there and encourage new life. 
From our experiments, we've seen that these NSEVs not only decrease the damage done from stroke, but actually improve the speed of recovery in even large detrimental strokes. To really illustrate this, I have two videos to show you in our large animal pig model of stroke. The first video is of me and an animal three days after stroke. This animal has not received treatment. For this testing, we walk the animal down a track, which measures property of their gait or walking, such as their pressure, speed, or stride length. As you can see, this animal needs a lot of encouragement from this rattle to successfully walk down the track. In contrast, here is an animal three days after stroke that has received these NSCEVs or seeds. As you can see, there's a perceptible difference in the speed of recovery of the animal that has received the NSCEVs compared to the animal that hasn't. Based on these experiments, we believe that our NSCEVs have promising potential to help the recovery of stroke patients worldwide. Now, I truly believe this twofold approach of continuing therapeutic development while also simultaneously working on immediately implementable techniques will be one of the keys to providing the best care we can for patients. But there's one last part of this game plan I've left out, and that's step three, or you. See, stroke has been a devastating disease for a long time, and I'm sure you've all been personally affected by it. Due to limited success in clinical trials, however, funding agencies and individuals have started to lose hope in the possibility of finding a cure for stroke. We want to reinvigorate the field, to believe in techniques for today while continuing to work towards a cure for tomorrow. In order to bring about this change, we need your confidence, support, and participation. This work is only possible through your endorsement, so we're actually asking you to show your support vocally and monetarily. Speak out on social media, in conversations with your communities, through political advocacy, and through contributions to research drives and taxes. Through your passion and support, we can bring awareness to the need for more stroke research. Together, through this raised awareness of stroke and multifaceted research approaches, we can start to re-landscape the field. Maybe one day, we'll be able to talk about life after stroke, not in months and years of rehab, but maybe in days and weeks. Not as a completely debilitating life event, but as an unfortunate setback. We can start to restructure the emphasis from an all-or-nothing game of therapeutic development to an all-or-something game that can help patients today. Frankly, because I want my granddad back. I want him back to his happy, healthy, jokester self, and I want to be able to hand him something that can make it better before it's too late. And I want the same for all of your loved ones and grandparents. And maybe, after today, we'll be one step closer to making that a reality. Thank you.